Amen. What a beautiful way to be ushered into a spirit of worship. It is my joy to welcome all of you this morning, whether you're joining us online or here in the sanctuary. The Spirit of Christ unites us in this time of worship, and it's good to be together. I would invite you to take a moment to register your attendance and let us know that you're here. There are registration pads here in the sanctuary at the end of each row, and online there should be a link that you can copy and paste into your browser and register online that way. Just a few announcements as we gather together this morning. As we leave worship this morning, I would encourage you to go into Reed Hall and visit. Uh, we have a table there that two of our church members, Kathy and Don Barnett, will be staffing. They are involved in Moms Demand Action for uh, gun control, reasonable gun control in our communities. And you may know, as I've shared with you, our annual conference of the United Methodist Church has um, signed a resolution in hopes that we could have reasonable gun regulation and Moms Demand Action is just one of the groups in our community that helps lead that advocacy. So if you want to know more and learn about what they do and how we can make our communities better and safer, please stop by the table after worship. Later this afternoon at 4 o'clock, uh, we will have Scott Detra here to perform an organ concert, and he is our guest, and we hope that you will attend and allow his music to lead you in a spirit of worship. Then the following Sunday at 4.30, both of our adult choirs will combine together to perform Duraflay's Requiem. That will be at 4.30 on All Saints Sunday. And what a perfect day to hear that piece and to offer that to God. We uh, wanted to remind you that we have a grief group that we are organizing. There's information in the bulletin. Uh, last, today is the last day to register. So if you have been thinking and praying about that, we would love for you to sign up for that uh, before the end of the day today. And finally, just if you'll mark your calendars for November 13th, we're going to designate that day as another Jubilee Sunday, a Sunday when we encourage all who are able to attend in worship to be present, and for those who worship online uh, to show up in real time on that day so we can all celebrate the goodness of God together at the same time. This morning, we hear the story of Zacchaeus. And what a joyful response he makes to his encounter with Jesus. May that joy be contagious to us as together we worship the Lord.
God seek us wherever we are. We in our hearts to the presence of God. God calls us all, regardless of our pain and our past. God's salvation is all embracing. Trusting that God's love for us is unconditional and God's mercy is everlasting, let us make our confession with the confidence of children of God. God of all creation, your love is everywhere to be found. Like Zacchaeus, we climb trees to get a glimpse of you, thinking we can keep you at a safe distance. But you invite us to hurry down and greet you face to face. Lord, open our hearts and minds so that when we gently bid us to come down from our tree, we listen and respond as Zacchaeus, transform and ready to live for others. And now, oh God, we offer you our individual confessions in silence. Hear the good news. God died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. Even in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. As a forgiven and reconciled people, let us exchange signs of reconciliation and love in whatever way is comfortable toward us. The peace of Christ be with you.
One of the great joys of the church is the baptism of children. This morning, Matt and Sarah Cote brings their son to God before the community of faith for baptism. My family in Christ, through the sacrament of baptism, we are initiated into Christ's holy church. We're incorporated into God's mighty acts of salvation and given new birth through water and the spirit. And all of this is God's gift offered to us without price. Matt and Sarah, I ask you now on behalf of the whole church these ancient questions of the faith as you bring your son forward for baptism. Do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, say, I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? If so, say, I do. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which Christ has opened to all people? If so, say, I do. And will you nurture this child in Christ's holy church that by your teaching and example, he may be guided to accept God's grace for himself, to profess his faith openly, and to lead a Christian life? If so, say, I will. My friends in the congregation, do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ? If so, say, we do. And will you nurture one another in the Christian faith and life and include this child now before you in your care? With God's help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround this child with the community of love and forgiveness that he may grow in service with others. We will pray for him to be a true disciple who walks in the way that leads to life. Let us pray. Eternal God, when nothing existed but chaos, you swept across the dark waters and brought forth light. In the days of Noah, you saved those on the ark through water. After the flood, you set in the clouds a rainbow. When you saw your people as slaves in Egypt, you led them to freedom through the sea. Their children you brought through the Jordan to the land which you promised. In the fullness of time, you sent Jesus, nurtured in the water of a womb. He was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. He called his disciples to share in the baptism of his death and resurrection and to make disciples of all nations. Pour out your Holy Spirit to bless this gift of water and this child who receives it, to wash away sin and clothe him in righteousness throughout his life, that dying and being raised with Christ, he may share in Christ's final victory. All praise to you, eternal God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns forever. Amen. What name have you given your son? James Matthew. James Matthew. James Matthew Cope. I baptize you in the name of God, the Father, Creator, Christ the Son, the Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, your advocate and comforter, who lives and reigns within you. Oh, that's okay. It wouldn't be the first time. You want to go with me to take a walk? Oh, well, it's all right. You want to go for a walk down the aisle? There's a dry cleaner just down the road. We'll be just fine. <laughs> it's okay. Come on with me. We're going to introduce James Matthew to your church family. And anyone who's a parent has been in the same situation. Wow, look at him. He is so happy to meet you all. <laughs> James, this is your church family, and they love you so much already. And they're going to do everything they can to teach you about God's unconditional love for you. And some of these folks are going to be Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and confirmation mentors. They're going to show you the way. And maybe one of these days you'll be up there playing handbells. So we're going to take a minute and listen as they all make their promises to you.
Will the congregation please stand and face James Matthew? Now is our joy to welcome our new brother in Christ. Members of the whole household of God, I commend James Matthew to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase his faith, confirm his hope, and perfect him in love. As members get the Let us pray together the prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and the word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Today's lesson is from Luke, chapter 19, starting with the first verse. As Jesus was passing through Jericho, there was a rich tax collector named Zacchaeus who was trying to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So Zacchaeus ran ahead, climbed a sycamore tree to see him because Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. But all who heard what Jesus said grumbled, and they said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner? Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay them back four times as much. Then Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
we have some children here who want to come forward and join me for a minute, or if you are worshiping from home and want to get a little closer to your screens, we'll wave to you. Come on down. Come on down. I got to see some of you in your costumes yesterday at Trunk or Treat. That was so fun. Welcome, welcome. Well, this story that Mr. Frank just wrote. Oh, come on up. Come on up. You can bring a friend, too, if you want. <laughs> come on up. We just heard a story in the Bible that's one of my favorites. It's about a man named Zacchaeus who was kind of small. Have you ever heard the word we to describe someone who's small? He's a wee little man. You have that pop-up book. Well, you may know the song that I want to sing for us and maybe ask you to join me to sing. I have a feeling that a lot of people sitting here also know this story, this song, because I learned it when I was your age. And a lot of people learned it when they were little. So we're all going to sing it together. I'm going to show you the motions. And we'll sing it through once. If you know it, join me. And then the second time we sing it, we'll all sing it together, okay? Here it goes. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. You could tell some people in the choir know it. They helped me sing it. Thank you. All right, we're going to do it again. If you want to, you can stand up and kind of follow the motions with me. And I'm going to invite everybody else to sing too. And you can do the motions too, but you can stay seated if you want to. But all right, let's help us out. Okay. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. For I'm going to your house today. Yay, you sounded really good. Thank you for helping me with that. One thing I love about that song is it reminds us of all the things that Zacchaeus did to see Jesus and all the things Jesus did to make Zacchaeus feel loved. Let's pray together. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this wonderful story where we get to see someone meet Jesus and be changed. Thank you for Zacchaeus' faith and his willingness to follow Jesus. Help us do the same. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, if you want to go to Children's Church, there's Pastor Maggie, Pastor Francis, and they will take you to Children's Chapel. I figured that uh, with COVID and the way that has affected church attendance, that we might have some little ones who hadn't learned that song yet. So I took it upon myself to teach them, and I knew a lot of you would know it, so thank you for helping me with that. One of the things that singing that song does is remind us of the embodiment that we see in this story of Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus. There are so many verbs in the story that drew my attention. We've got Zacchaeus running and climbing and Jesus calling up and Zacchaeus standing there and then giving away half his possessions. So many incredible verbs in this story. And it's those verbs that I really want to focus on this morning. But before we get there, we have a couple of other parts of speech I want to look at real quickly. Just a noun and a couple of adjectives. In case this is a new story to you and you haven't heard it before, or maybe it's been a while, Luke tells us at the beginning of the story that Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector. Now, we talked a little bit last week, if you were here, about tax collectors and why they were despised by their neighbors. Tax collectors were typically Jews who decided to collaborate with the Roman government to collect taxes. 
Rome set the rate of the taxes they wanted, and then the tax collectors would set up a franchise, and they could collect as much as they wanted above and beyond that. So if you saw a rich tax collector, you knew that he had gotten rich off of his fellow Jews. So it's no wonder that the people in the community didn't think very highly of these tax collectors. Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector, which means he sits at the top of the pyramid in Jericho, that he is benefiting from this oppressive system of taxation. And the richer he gets, the more despised he probably is. And he's probably built his wealth on some extortion and dishonesty and all of those things that we can fill in the blanks. So he is a chief tax collector. And Luke also uses the adjective rich. He is rich. Now up to this point in Luke's gospel, every time we have seen that word, it's not been positive. There's not a lot of good so far that we have seen come of the rich in Luke's gospel. It begins with Mary's song when she conceives Jesus and says, you have filled the hungry with good things, but the rich you've sent away empty. Or Jesus' sermon in chapter 7 where he says, blessed are the poor and woe to you who are rich. We've seen parables of Jesus, the rich fool who builds so many barns just so he can accumulate and keep all that he has. Or the rich man in Lazarus, the rich man who's all about enjoying his own wealth all for himself and walks every day over the body of Lazarus, a poor man who lies at his gate. And then right before this encounter with Zacchaeus, Jesus is approached on the road by a rich man who wants to know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, who seems to recognize the the priority that possessions have in this man's life, says to him, go sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. And the man can't do it. And he walks away from Jesus' invitation. And as he walks away, Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's easy to hear that and and be discouraged and lose hope. But then we have the story of Zacchaeus that has a different ending. So we enter into this story knowing these things about Zacchaeus, chief tax collector, he's rich, and he's also short of stature. Because of that, he can't see when he's in the crowd. And it's because of his height that leads to some of the verbs in the story that really drew my attention and inspired me this week. Because he can't see, he decides to climb a tree. Now there's something in Zacchaeus, Luke tells us, that wants to see Jesus. He wants and longs to see Jesus. That's the first verb that drew my attention, that longing, that desire to see more of Jesus. We don't know why. We don't know if he was just curious, if this was just the latest interesting thing to pass through Jericho, or if he'd heard somewhere that Jesus was was called a friend to tax collectors, if Jesus, he knew Jesus had a disciple who had been a tax collector, Levi, also known as Matthew. We don't know, but there is a longing within him. And it is deep enough for him to do these next two actions, these next two verbs that we come across. He runs ahead of the crowd and climbs a tree. These are two things that an adult male would not do in public in Jesus' day. It's undignified. He's making himself ridiculous in front of the crowds, crowds who already despise him, and yet somehow he doesn't care. He's so focused on seeing Jesus that he runs and he climbs just to see him. And I pause there and I think, when was the last time I was that hungry for God? When was the last time I ran to church or I hurried so I could get home in time to have time in prayer? Or that I was so excited to be able to do something for God that I rushed and hurried to do it. And here I see Zacchaeus running and climbing a tree, not caring what other people think. And it makes me reflect on my own desire for God. 
So there he is up in the tree. And suddenly Jesus is there. And we see what Jesus does when he sees Zacchaeus. He sees Zacchaeus. He calls him by name. I don't know how he knew Zacchaeus' name, but he calls him by name. And he says, Zacchaeus, hurry down. Not just come down, but hurry down. For I must stay at your house today. And here in these verbs, I think we, we hear Jesus' eagerness to be with Zacchaeus. Jesus' desire to, to welcome Zacchaeus and show him a different way. Isn't it something to think that whatever our desire and love for God is, God's desire and pursuit of us is so much more. Jesus is already there, ready to call Zacchaeus by name. And God calls each and every one of us by name and says, hurry to be with me, for I must stay with you today. Now this verb, stay, can also be translated dwell or abide. I must abide with you. I want to abide with you. I want to come and take up residence in your life and in your heart That's the invitation to Zacchaeus and to us. And what does Zacchaeus do? He scrambles down the tree. Well, I guess you don't scramble like that. He scrambles down the tree as fast as he can. And he is happy to welcome Jesus. We can just feel Zacchaeus' enthusiasm and his excitement that he's been seen for who he is and not just as a tax collector or an outcast. He is so overjoyed by being received. Now, there are many people who say this encounter with, between Jesus and Zacchaeus is, is the pattern of discipleship, that we might be curious about God, but God has already come to us. God comes to us as we are, loves us and accepts us and calls us by name, and we just receive and welcome Christ into our hearts. But as good Wesleyans, as good Methodists, we know that there's more to discipleship. We know that now what comes next is the response. The response to that grace and acceptance and unconditional love that we talk so much about around here. And for Zacchaeus, the response shows up most clearly in how he deals with his possessions. Before he met Jesus, I imagine his possessions were what gave him his identity, gave him meaning in life. But now that he's met Jesus, he's willing to give half of it away. Look, Lord, he says, half of my possessions I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone, I will pay them back four times over, far beyond what the law required. Inherent in that is to me saying, I'm going to do business differently from now on. I'm not going to extort and be dishonest from now on. I'm going to be different and I'm going to be generous. His encounter with Jesus shaped his relationship with his possessions, shaped his place in the community. Because, you know, it wasn't just Zacchaeus who was transformed in this moment. His transformation had ripple effects all through the community. One of the wealthiest men in Jericho now giving half of it away to the poor, it seems he lifted up everyone with his generosity. And so the question and invitation that arises from this moment in the story is, how does my relationship with Jesus shape my verbs? How does it shape the way I act in the world? What I do with my possessions, how I treat other people, how I navigate life in the community. There's a theologian, and I can't remember who it was who said it. I didn't have time to Google it. I thought of it this morning as I was getting ready. But he said, he used, coined the term practical atheists. That a lot of us walk around saying we believe in God, but it doesn't really change how we live our lives. That how we live our lives basically looks like how most people live their lives around us. And that's not who we are, and that's not who we want to be. We want to be disciples of Jesus whose lives look different 
whose lives are transformed because of our relationship with God through him. And so the challenge and invitation is to look at every aspect of my life, every aspect of our lives. Now we're in this season of, of giving and praying and thinking about what is going to be my gift to the ministries of the church in 2023. And this story of Zacchaeus just happens to fall in the lectionary. So don't worry, I'm not going to say, okay, everybody just give half and we'll be fine. (laughs) There's no magic formula. But it does raise the question, if I look at all my, what I spend my money on, does it reflect a life that's been transformed by the love and grace of God? Is there a way that I can give of myself and of what I have that liberates me and lifts up others in our community? The story of Zacchaeus inspires me to reflect on that. Earlier this week, I went to Green Hills Library and I cast my votes for the election. And in this voting season, it's worth asking the question, how does my relationship with Christ shape how I make those decisions? Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a huge believer in the separation of church and state. As a pastor, as a church, I should never tell anybody how to vote or for whom to vote or what party to vote for because no candidate, no party has a lock on the gospel. The gospel comes first above loyalty to anything else. But I do think it's important for us as followers of Jesus to recognize that part of our life and our interaction in the community should grow out of our faith. I confess I've gone into the voting booth sometimes and I've said, I don't remember what that amendment's about. Oh, well, I guess I won't vote, or I'll just mm, decide. Is it not my faithful response to educate myself and to consider the question, what will be best for my neighbors? There are so many different verbs that we live out, different ways that we live out our faith. As we go from this place, from everything from running errands to interacting with our families, how does our encounter with Christ shape everything that we do? Not only the verbs, but I'm going to end with one more part of speech, the adverb. When I look at Zacchaeus, I see a man who responds joyfully. That's our calling as well. Not to do all of these things because we're trying to earn God's favor or check a box or because somebody made me feel guilty, but because I have been named and claimed by God through Jesus Christ and joyfully I want my life to be transformed. I want to be generous and thoughtful and engaged in my community and making a difference. So we've gone from nouns to adjectives to verbs to adverbs. Perhaps we'll just end with an exclamation that Zacchaeus himself might have said that day. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God that we are seen and loved and sent out to do. me as we affirm our faith together, number 883 in the hymnal. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to our prayer time this morning, I invite you to lift up both your silent and your spoken prayers. 
If you would like to share them with the pastoral team to pray throughout the week, please follow the link under Contact Us on our website. Uh, or if you're here with us in the sanctuary, there are gray cards in the pew racks in front of you. You can fill those out and place them in the offering plates as they're passed in a few moments. This morning, we celebrate the birth of Jane Virginia London, who was born October 17th in Washington, D.C., to Ben and Julie London. She's welcomed also by her brothers Jacob and Graham London and grandparents Linda London and Ed Van Voorhees. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God who sees us, we have come to this time of worship hoping for an encounter with you. Some of us have come with joy and thanksgiving. Others of us have come carrying burdens that feel heavy and overwhelming. But however we've arrived in this place and time, we give you thanks that we are not alone. You have called us by name. You have invited us into relationship with you and one another, and you have offered us salvation. We praise you for your steadfast love, your compassion, and your grace. O oh, great Redeemer, there are many who need your special attention this day. We lift up to you all who suffer, all who grieve, all who live with shame or guilt. We remember those who feel far from you and those who struggle with questions that seem to have no adequate answers. Hold each of these close, dear Jesus. May they be enfolded in your care and your love. We pray, too, for the concerns of our world, and we lift up to you places where there is hunger and famine, conflict and war, and where people are not able to flourish with dignity and equality. Guide each of us with our very gifts to do all that we can to alleviate the suffering of others. This morning, especially, we lift up to you the families of those who lost their lives in Seoul, Korea this weekend. May they be comforted in their grief and surrounded with support. All of our prayers, O oh God, whether spoken aloud or spoken within our hearts, we offer to you in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. I'm Bill Ferris, this year's chair of the Finance Committee, and I'm here to give you a status report where the church is financially as of September 30th. Ours is an active and generous and loving congregation, and there are many ways to participate in the life of West End United Methodist. And we, as one church, as one church family, are very active. With this said, we must be aware of our financial health. Our church facilities are in use just about every day and evening. Think about the electricity, water usage, cleaning services, maintenance, security, and repair costs. After all, this is an old building. We love our ministers, staff, our music, and our outreach programs. All these are funded by your generosity. We as a church family do so much, and we should be proud of what we do for the community. Now the not so good news. Each of us is painfully aware that inflation year to date is currently running just over 8%. And 
and the stock market is down 14%. It's more like a roller coaster. These percentages have a direct effect on each of us. Our church finances are also affected directly. As of September 30th, our actual income was $1,550,000, which is $36,000 lower than what we budgeted. Our expenses year to date total $1,891,000, which is $155,000 over the budget. To put it another way, through September 30th, our expenses exceed our income for a shortfall of $341,000. Where, how do we account for our income? For this year, of approximately 550 households in the church, 345 made an estimate of giving, or a pledge as we used to call it. This means 33% of our households did not make an estimate. We'd love to improve that number. This year, our total amount pledged was $1,864,000. And our total budgeted income, $2,445,000. In order to offer next year's balanced budget, we will take this year's estimate of giving and add, hopefully, a good educated guess as to the amount that will be given by those who do not send in pledges. The good news is that for the last several years, our members in November and December of that year have sent in 40% of our total budgeted income. And in those years, our budget's balanced. The bad news at least for this chair of the Finance Committee, these last two months are a very nervous time. I've already got enough gray hair. Our staff and lay leaders have worked hard to give us a preliminary budget for 2023. In this economic uncertainty, next year's expense budget is roughly 3% more than last year's budget. So I ask, that you do complete your estimate of giving cards. The more pledges we receive, the less guesswork we have to do. And please remember, if possible, next year try to complete your annual giving before November and December. We know times are tough, but try to be generous. Giving is just one way that we can live out our faith every day. Friends, we can do this for God, our church, and for each other joyfully. Thank you. Let us now gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. For those of you joining us online, you're invited to give via the options listed on the screen. While here in the sanctuary, we will pass the offering plates down the rows in a few moments. May we give with joy this morning to the God who has been so generous with us.
seated for just a moment and invite Tom and Laurie Lee too, if you'd like to come up. Laurie, okay, just Tom. Uh, for us to take a moment to pray with and for Tom. Our United Methodist Church has jurisdictions. Our southeast jurisdiction uh, will be gathering in at the end of this week, and part of what the, the work that they do, all of the delegates, is to elect new bishops and to decide where the bishops will be sent. And Tom is one of the delegates from our annual conference, and we are very blessed by his leadership, and we wanted to take a moment just to pray for him and pray for the jurisdictional conference that God's wisdom and love would guide them all and um, whether that means we will get a new bishop or not, we don't know. So there's some questions around that, and we're just trusting the process and trusting our delegates who go to be led by God. So if you'll take a moment and kneel before us. We will pray for Tom now and continue our prayers for him and the whole delegation throughout the week. Let us pray. Gracious God, as a church and as a denomination, we work within structures and processes, and we do our best uh, to be faithful in those structures and processes. And as this jurisdictional conference comes to pass, we know that there will be votes and decisions and discernments made to help structure and empower the life of your church, the United Methodist Church. So we pray for our current bishop, Bill McAlilly, for his continued healing and health. We pray for all the delegates like Tom who will be making their way to Lake Junaluska this week. We ask that you would cover them all with your grace, give them wisdom and discernment so that all we do might glorify you, might strengthen the church to witness for your unconditional love in this world that needs so much to hear that good news. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Thank you, Tom, for your leadership.
As we prepare to leave this time together, I invite you, if you choose, to return to your seats and enjoy the closing voluntary as a final act of worship, or to go in fellowship in the narthex or in Reed Hall and visit the table there to greet one another in the peace of Christ. We have been called by name. May we never be the same. Go in peace to do in Christ's name. Amen.